John chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We'll stop the reading there, really stopping in the, almost the middle of the prayer. But we want to deal particularly with verses 14 through 16 eventually today. Romans 8, 34. Read this verse last week. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also is making, the King James maketh, but he's he's making intercession for us. Paul encourages every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ by telling us that our exalted Savior is interceding for us right now at the right hand of God. If the Spirit of God would burn that reality into your soul, it'll affect you very deeply. It's a truth you need to take with you. Hebrews 7.25 says much the same thing. Telling us that Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for those who come to God through Him. 
The salvation of God is a sure salvation. Made secure by the past substitutionary sacrifice and the resurrection life of Jesus Christ and His ongoing intercession, His ongoing intercessory prayer for us. As we saw last week, this intercessory prayer that Jesus prays here is not just, it's not an unnecessary addendum to the more important work of Christ. It's a part of the work of Christ for us. No, oh, brethren, John 17 is such a rich blessing from God to us. He didn't have to save this. He didn't have to record this. He didn't have to preserve this. These are the very words of the God-man, Jesus Christ, spoken to His Father, and they've been preserved for us. That, this is a blessing that I suppose we have not appreciated like we should. And it's for us. It's for His disciples on earth. Jesus petitions His Father to keep and sanctify them. And by extension, us. Those who believe on Him through their word, the apostles. That He might be glorified in us, believers, collectively. Individually, yes, but collectively. He has us in view collectively here. As we have seen already, and we'll see again before we're finished with this prayer. The dangers and discouragements for disciples of Christ in this world are real. Aren't they? They're real. But the chief shepherd and bishop of our souls cares for his sheep and he says, I'm not going to lose one. And as he speaks to his father here, he says, I haven't lost one. And he adds the name Judas, as we saw last week, just to remind his disciples that Judas wasn't really lost. Judas was never given. He wasn't one that the father gave to the son. I pray not for the world. I pray for them which thou hast given me out of the world. Those are the ones that he says that the Father chose out of the world to give to the Son. Judas wasn't one of those. And he adds that in this prayer, I think, to encourage these eleven. For if Judas could leave, what about me? In fact, Peter, you remember, not long after this, flat out denies the Lord, but he wasn't lost. Have you ever denied the Lord? Have, have you ever in your timidity and weakness, shyness, not stood up for the name of Christ in this world? Aren't you thankful that your salvation is not dependent on that? Oh, you, you were recovered. You didn't stay in that place. But you see, Jesus prays for His sheep. And if you're one of His sheep, He's praying for you. And this prayer really is about the journey. It's not so much about the end as it is about the way to the end, the here and now, the path to the celestial city, not the celestial city itself. It's, it's about this life. It's about what we encounter here. It's about being kept and sanctified here. It's about reaching that place where we will forever glorify Him. But we must glorify Him here and now. And we can't do that in our own strength. Jesus is concerned that His disciples are preserved and persevere in the face of opposition, which He has already said is coming, and He repeats that here in the passage before us in this prayer. Fundamental to the success of every disciple of Jesus in this world as, and the experience of joy. And by the way, the experience of joy is part of the success of what Jesus has secured for His people. It really is. The experience of joy right now in this life. No matter how difficult it is. But fundamental to that success is the consciousness of who God is to us in and because of Jesus Christ. 
And I want to revisit just briefly here some thoughts that I set forth last week, but perhaps raced over them too quickly for some, and maybe it hasn't sunk in. And I think this reality needs to sink in. Notice how Jesus petitions in verse 11. He says, Holy Father. This is the name that Jesus has uniquely manifested to these Jewish disciples. He said in verse 6, as he speaks to his Father, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. And then in verse 11, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as, as we are. Now Israel, the nation of Israel, knew God. And they knew the name of God. The name of God was Jehovah. That is my name, he says. Yahweh. All capital letters. L-O-R-D in your English, most English translations. And I just note here that the name Jehovah has as the root of that name, the name I Am. Hava or Yah which is the Hebrew for being. Yohava is Jehovah. And that's interesting, because Jesus came and declared Himself to be. Hava, I am. He is Yahweh. He is Lord. Come in the flesh. But here He is, coming into this world, and He says to His Father, I have manifested Thy name. And so he has manifested himself as I am. He has said, I am Jehovah. There is no God beside the almighty, awesome, thunderously glorious, sovereign creator God of Israel. And that's the one that Jesus is manifesting. Truly, he is to be feared by all nations. Jesus is certainly not manifesting another God. That's the God he is manifesting. But he is manifesting this God in a most intimate way way. You see, in the Old Testament, Father was not commonly used in reference to Jehovah. Jeremiah prophesied in Jeremiah 3.19, Thou shalt call me my Father, and shall not turn away from me. I want to read another prophetic word in, in Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verses 15. And 16, look down from heaven and behold from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory, holy Father, holy. And the Old Testament is replete with expressions of that holy God who is to be feared. Where is thy zeal and thy strength? The sounding of thy bowels and of thy mercies toward me. Are they restrained? Doubtless thou art our Father. Through eight, Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our Father, our Redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. But it's not very frequent that you see those kinds of expressions in the Old Testament in reference to the Lord God of Israel. But then you flip over to the New Testament. And something happens. In fact, if you do a search of the word Father, and you see it in the Old Testament, you'll see most of the many References of Father, it's small f. And then when you turn the page to the New Testament, immediately you see an overwhelming capital F, Father, all through the New Testament. Something has happened. The Son of God came from heaven to make God known in a way that was more clearly relational, more clearly than had ever been known before, he took it upon Himself. He who is called by Isaiah in Isaiah 9, 6. He who was said, who it is said of was, would, would come. The, the Son, a child is born, a Son is given. 
His name shall be called Everlasting Father. He is the revealer of the Father. He is the re revealer of God as the Father. And the New Testament, especially John, explodes with the revelation of God as Father. Not only as Creator of all living, but especially of all who are in Christ Jesus. In fact, we skipped, I wouldn't say skipped over the verse, but we didn't really say a whole lot about it. We'll probably say more about it later on in, as we get to a later verse of this prayer. But in verse 5, Jesus said, And now, O Father, glorify... I mean, listen to that. He wants you to know who He's speaking to. He wants you to know who God is. O Father... Glorify thou me with thine own self, with your own being, with the glory which I had with thee. Not just beside him, but with him. Before the world was. I asked the question, I think I asked it last week. It was in a bulletin article at least, I think this last week. What was God doing before there was a creation. There you have it. Father, Son, Holy Spirit were relating. We have a relational God, which is one of the great differences between the God of this book, the God of the Bible, the God of Christianity, and the God of Islam, or even the God of Judaism. And the relationship that we have with one another is a relationship that is based upon that infinite relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'll probably say more about this at other times. But verse 5 is revelatory to us regarding the nature of God. He is the eternal Father. How do we know that? The Son is praying to His Father. There's always been Father. There's always been Son. In and by Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. We know God as the Son knows the Father in Him. When we come to Him, we... Engage in a relationship with God that is unlike any other relationship we've other ha ever had with a deity. We enter into a relationship with the Father of the Son who in Christ becomes our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Our Father. And that is... His name to every born-again child of God. And the Father has answered the prayer of His Son, as we saw last week, and made His disciples one by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who is the seal of promise, who is called earlier in John 14, another comforter. You remember Jesus says, I'll ask, I'll pray. I'll ask the Father and He'll send you another comforter. He's done that. By the Spirit, because of the Son, God is our Father by regeneration and by adoption. We have a relationship with Him that is closer, more intimate, and eternal, unlike any other relationship. Let me read a couple of verses here. This is not really something that I'm wanting to expand upon any more this morning, but I do want to read these verses because I believe you need to meditate upon this reality. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power 
And that word power there is the word that can be translated as it is in our margin here, but it may be translated in other translations here, the right or the privilege or the, the authority. You have the right. You've been given the right to become the sons of God. Amen. This is not who you were. This is who you've become. Even to them that believe on His name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then Paul, in Galatians 4 and verse 6, you need to meditate upon this verse. This is a, our memory verse for this coming week. I hope you will. I hope you will ask the Holy Spirit of God to allow this verse to get hold of you, that your soul will be able to be wrapped around, or this verse wrapped around your soul and affect you. Amen. Galatians 4 and verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son. Isn't that what Jesus has prayed for? into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. If you are able to cry, Abba, Father, if in the depths of your soul you're able to reach out in that cry, that expressive cry, that dependent cry, Father, it's because the Spirit of Christ is in you producing that. You're a child of God. Hallelujah. And that ought to encourage you. Paul says this again in Romans chapter 8. Verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Have you, perhaps some of you lately through your experience of life, you've come to a place in your soul where you've been so weak and so troubled and found the difficulty so great that the only thing you could do is through tears cry, Father, help me. Help me. What a privilege. The, 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 the God of this universe has given to you to cry, Abba, Father. For the Spirit itself which is a literal rendering of the neuter pronoun, but Himself, and Spirit is neuter, and that's why the King James translates it that way here, but the Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's future. Well, that's present, but it's also future. But here's the present reality, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. And so our eternal Father is committed to our care in this world, and, that's, and Jesus knows this. And so as Jesus prays, He's not praying to a stranger, He's praying, He's praying to the one that He has known forever. He knows Him. He is one with Him. And what we have just read in Galatians 4 and Romans 8 is an answer to Jesus' prayer. And this ought to generate joy in us, which is one of the reasons Jesus says what He says in verse 13. I speak these things in the world. That they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. We're hearing, we know this is what Jesus is praying, knowing that He's prayed these things ought to generate joy in our spirit. Joy for the disciple of Jesus 
is not dependent upon this world. Joy for the disciple of Jesus is dependent upon the Spirit, making the Son known more clearly. Jesus says that's what He'll do. When He comes, He's going to glorify Me. And as the Spirit makes the Son known more clearly, our hearts are assured of our Father's care and His commitment to keep us. And there is joy that is generated in us. It's all connected. In this prayer, Jesus is empathizing with His disciples. They're still in the world. And He knows what that means. He knows our difficulty today. 2,000 years after He prayed this prayer. On earth, He is still in relationship with His Father, caring, concerned. For you who are disciples of Jesus Christ. And so in verses 14 through 16, he continues in this prayer. I have given them thy word. And then he emphasizes the position of his disciples. The world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So you can feel perhaps the empathy of Jesus as he, he knows what it is to feel the attack of the world. He knows His disciples are going to feel the same attack, and so He knows they're going to need help if they're going to survive. Jesus acknowledges before His Father that He has given the final word from heaven. When He says, I have given them Thy word, that is a huge statement. He's really referred to this several times in the prayer already. But I have given them Thy word. Jesus is not only our high priest. He is our prophet. The eternal Word who came into this world. He wasn't the first prophet. There were other prophets. Moses was a prophet. Elijah was a prophet. There were other prophets that gave the Word of Jehovah. But they were not the final Word. In fact, Moses said in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 18, I will raise up, these are the words of the Lord coming through Moses, I will raise up, raise them up, a prophet from among their brethren like unto them, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And that's exactly what Jesus has been saying through the Gospel of John He's been repeating that theme. I've said that which my Father has given to me. I've spoken the words from my Father. I have not spoken on my own. By the way, He said that the Spirit wouldn't speak on His own either. Remember that? He said the Spirit will not speak of Himself. Isolated from the Father and the Son. This is a triune God and a triune God salvation. But Jesus came from heaven and He did not merely speak on behalf of God as the prophets before Him. His were not words that came to Him in dreams or visions. He is the very Word of God. He spoke that which came from the bosom of His Father, John 1.18. The invisible God was made known by the words of Jesus. It was upon the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus made this very clear. As Moses and Elijah appeared on that mount with Jesus, Peter, all excited, said, let's build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And a voice thundered there upon that mount, sending Peter to the ground and saying, this is my beloved Son, hear ye him. The final word 
the prophet from heaven. Not just the one who speaks the words of heaven, but the word himself. Hear ye him. And when the disciples looked up, you remember the account all. It says they saw Jesus only. Oh, what a message there is for us there. You see, Jesus' words, like Himself, shine with greater glory than Moses or Elijah. They pointed to Him, but they are not Him. And this is what disturbed the Jews so much. They placed so much stock in Moses and the prophets and Abraham. And Jesus has already said earlier in His ministry, if you believed Moses, you would believe Me. For Moses spoke of me. Before before Abraham was, I am. His words were not simply additions to Moses. His words were the fulfillment of Moses and the prophets. In fact, he is the fulfillment of Moses and the prophets. As John said in chapter 1, Jesus came. Declaring grace and truth. He came personifying grace and truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The final revelation of God to this world was given to the apostles. And I think that's primarily what Jesus means here. Though I think by extension it goes beyond them. But he says, he says in verse 14, I have given them thy word. And of course, the Spirit of truth is going to come and going to guide them into all of that, those words that Jesus gave to them so that they would record those words. And we have the New Testament because of it. They were commissioned, the disciples, the apostles, were commissioned with the responsibility of preaching and recording all truth concerning Jesus Christ. I have given... Father, Holy Father, I have given them thy word. What an awesome privilege that was. What an awesome responsibility that was. But you see, Jesus is leaving. What's going to happen to the word that he gave them? What's going to happen to these that he gave the word to? They're going to need another comforter. They're going to need somebody who's going to abide with them always. Just like you and me. Jesus said, I have given them thy word. And here's the problem. The world hath hated them. Because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world. The world hates the word of truth. The world hates those who are the bearers of the word of truth. Who is the world? On several occasions just this night, Jesus had made, has made reference to a being who is powerful. He has called him the prince of the world twice on this evening. And back in chapter 13, he said of Judas, Satan hath entered him. Satan has come unto him. Jesus acknowledges the prince of the world. Jesus acknowledges Satan. He's a real being. He's a real problem. Who is the world? The world is all who are under the powerful influence of Satan. Those who are under the powerful influence of the prince of the power of the air. John describes the world in 1 John 5 and verse 19 as being under the domain of wickedness. He says, the whole world lies in wickedness. Or that word wickedness is actually translated in verse 18 just before that as wicked one. And it can be translated either way. Wickedness or wicked one. Just as in this prayer when Jesus says in verse 15, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. It could be 
the evil or the evil one, which has led me to this conclusion that this is the sum total of the powerful influence of the evil one, called evil. Everything going on in this world under the influence of Satan, the wicked one, the evil one, is evil. It doesn't matter what it looks like to you and me. God calls it evil. And He said the whole world lies or is under the domination of wickedness. Paul warns against the wiles of the devil. He warns against the fiery darts of the wicked. That's Satan. And that's what he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 6. Peter warns that this wicked one is like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. He has destructive intentions. He is after your destruction. Some of the things that we see in this world, and frankly, I know sometimes we say we're better off to isolate ourselves and not know what's going on in the world, and maybe that's true. But sometimes I think it's a hindrance to us because I don't know that we're really aware of how destructive the evil one is. There are things that occur in this world that can only be explained by a power such as is being described by Jesus. This evil, the evil one who is influencing the world. Brethren, this evil that Jesus has in mind as He prays is not only the gross immorality, the moral debauchery, that's all around us in our nation and the world. And it's not simply the denial of God's existence that He has in mind here. It is a spirit of rebellion against the glory of God in the person and work of His only begotten Son that He has in view. That spirit of rebellion that manifested itself among the religious Jews. I want to read a lengthy passage here. Go back to John chapter 8. This is that evil that's in the world. In John chapter 8 and verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I have given them thy word, but my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my Father, and you do that which you have seen with your Father. Father, I have given them your word. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. I have a religious heritage. My father was a preacher. My grandfather was a religious man. And I'll just assume that my whole heritage is full of Christianity. Certainly I'm okay. But now you seek to kill me. A man that I told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You de do the deeds of your father. I'm telling you, there are offspring of true believers who would just as well put a sword in the side of Jesus if they could get to Him. They hate Him. They hate His truth. They hate His Word. That's the evil in the world. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. They weren't God deniers. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me. If, 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 if God is forever eternally a Father, He forever eternally has a Son. And I'm standing before you and I'm telling you, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. But you're denying that. And my Father is not your Father. That's to say God is not your God. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but He sent me. 
Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You're of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you'll do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the, in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. He's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. One of the differences, one of the main differences between the children of God and the children of the devil is the children of God believe the truth. They believe Jesus. That's what they said. Jesus said, Father, I gave them your word and, and they have believed. They believe. They've received it. They've kept it. They believed. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. What a commentary that is on the very verse that we're seeing in John 17. And the world hath hated them. Oh, Jesus has already said this to the disciples on this very night. He said, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. In fact, he basically said to them, listen, if you don't want to endure the hatred of the world, be one with them. But if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to endure the hatred of the world. Because they are not of the world, Jesus says. Father, here's the problem. Father, he's empathizing. Father, here's the problem. I, I, I gave, I've given them thy word. And the world hath hated them because... They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And as sure as I'm, maybe I shouldn't try to put words in Jesus' mouth, but this seems to be the sense, as sure as, as I am departing from this world, just as sure they're going to want to follow me out of this. They're going to want to be with me where I am right now. You remember the madman of Gadara? Isn't that what happened? He says, I want to go with you. And Jesus said, no, you stay here i got a work for you to do here. Jesus was in the... This is a major emphasis, by the way. He says it in verse 14. And the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And then he makes the comment, verse 15, and then verse 16, he says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. If some of us were hearing Jesus pray, we would have been thinking, immediately we would have been thinking, you just said that. Why are you saying that again? Why are you repeating yourself? We heard you the first time. There's a point of emphasis going on here. And the point of emphasis is, you are not of the world. While you're in the world, you're not of the world. Just like Jesus. Father, they are not of the world. They have been born from above. They've been born again. They have eternal life. They are not of the world. They are of another world. Eternal life is at work in them. His disciples were motivated by a new principle of life that's not passing away like the world. Remember how many times the Scriptures refer to that? In 1 John chapter 2, the world is passing away with the lust thereof. But they are not of the world. They're motivated by a, a principle of, of life that goes on and on. It's the life of God in their soul. Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life. And if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, His Word has been given to you, and your relationship to Him in His Word creates a difference with the attitude and philosophies of the world. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. Just as the one you are trusting and following is not of the world, you're like Him. 
You know, there are only two categories of people in the world. Have you heard me say that before? And you know why you've heard me say that before? It's because the scriptures say it over and over and over again in different ways. Two categories of people in the world. They are those who are of the world and those who are not. That's it, Jesus says. Father, they, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. John puts it a, another way in 1 John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. We won't turn there. But here's the phrases, and you can go back there and look. The first six or seven verses of 1 John 4, he's drawing this contrast, and he says, They are of the world. We are of God. There it is. You're either of the world, or you are of God. And if you are of the world, you reject the message of heaven. You reject the messenger of heaven, and you reject everlasting life. In some way, at some level, to some degree, some more blatantly than others, but all just the same, really. But if you are of God, your life is all about the word given from heaven. I have given them thy word, and you know that, and you connect with it, and you desire it. You have a you gladly receive the word, Brother Dexter. Those of you who find nothing in this word for you, in fact, you would just assume, in fact, your life wouldn't change one lick if you never opened this book the rest of your born days. I say to you, there is no eternal life in you. Is that too harsh? One of the characteristics of those who are of God is you want, to, you want to know Him. You want to hear from Him. And there's only one way that He communicates in this age in which we live. And that's through this, this final word. I have given them. Jesus says, Hebrews 1 has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. That's the final word. It's been given been given. If you are of the world, you are ruled by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, which John says in 1 John 2.16 is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so if you're of the world, you are ruled by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I didn't say you aren't affected by those things. As long as you're in this world, you're going to be affected by those things. But are you ruled by them? Is your life governed by them? Is, are the decisions in your life made on the basis of your lust, your desires, this world? Is that how your life is characterized? If it is and you're a true child of God, right now the Spirit of God must be poking at you. Must be. Has to be. Or I wonder that there's any life in you. Because the Spirit of Christ responds to the Word. And if you have the Spirit of Christ, He responds to the very thing that He gave. There's a relationship between the Spirit of Christ and the Word. This, this dovetails into next week's message, Sanctify them through Thy truth, Thy Word is truth. If you are of the world, you're ruled by the lust of the flesh. If you are of God, not of this world, you live in this world controlled by another spirit. It's the Spirit of Christ. And you're the only ones that can walk in the Spirit. Now you can also be affected by the flesh. But there's no other kind of person in this world. If you're of this world, you cannot walk in the Spirit. But if you're of God, you can. And you must. And there's a battle. 
And you've got to fight. And here's the thing that concerns Jesus in this prayer. The spirit of the world will always be against the followers of Jesus who have his spirit. Hatred will, he says, the world has hated them. Hatred will, will manifest in some form. It may not be martyrdom, but hatred will manifest when disciples of Christ proclaim the exclusive claims of Jesus Christ. The moment you open up your mouth or in some way publicize the truth of God's Word as absolute, here's what God says, I can tell you the world bristles. There's a hatred, an ingrained hatred. And hatred will manifest when disciples of Christ practice the exclusive claims of Christ. And maybe that's more important because you know what? The world doesn't really care too much if you just blow smoke. They, they know the smoke will clear. But you live it consistently. I think what you'll find from at least a large portion of the world, they will respect the fact that you are consistent. They'll hate you. They don't want anything to do with that consistency, but they will respect you at least you do what you say. And even the world can appreciate that. Have you all found that the world is a hostile environment for true followers of Jesus Christ? We feel it, don't we? What's the answer? What's the solution? How will disciples of Jesus survive? You see the answer, don't you? I pray. Not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. I pray not. You know, Jesus could have prayed differently. He could have said, Father, take them away with me. Father, save them and snatch them out. He could have, he could have prayed that way. But that doesn't fit the kingdom, that doesn't fit the way that God has determined His kingdom would be. But, he says, and the word but, there is a strong contrast. He intends you to hear the contrast. I, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but, while they're in the world, but, while they're living in the world, while they're while they're working in the world, while they're in neighborhoods, while, while they're grocery shopping, while they're functioning. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the way. He doesn't say, I pray that you'll lead them to have their own little commune somewhere where they won't even touch the world. Well, the world won't even know they exist except through some National Geographic story. Oh, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Preserve them from the evil implication. The evil's going to be there. The evil is going to seek to crowd into their lives. The evil one. That's why Paul writes what he writes and Peter writes what he writes. We're living in hostile territory. We're kind of like in the enemy's camp. We're in the world. But God cannot and God does not leave us alone. I'm so thankful for this. 
And you may think because of your way of thinking that it's all been about you and you've succeeded in your life to wherever you are because of you and the way you've done things. If you think that way, you don't really understand your enemy. You don't understand the world. You don't really understand what's going on. You may just be a deceived Pharisee. But if you really understand what's going on, according to Jesus, you understand you've got to have God or you will not be kept. We cannot survive without the ever-present help of the Father through the Son, by the Spirit, and join together with one another. Which is what the New Testament expands upon to accomplish His will on earth. That's the church. If you're a believer here today, be thankful for what Jesus is praying here. Leave today with confidence. Not in yourself. And you know, I've thought about this. What do I need to do today? I need, I need to write an article. I need to preach just the right message. I need to write a book that's going to, so that folks can, you know, they can leave today and they've got 10 easy steps to success. No, here's what you need. You need, you need to know God, right? And there's only one way you can know Him. That's the Spirit of God making Him known to you. You need what Jesus prayed for here. You need to see Christ more clearly. You need to recognize who you are. Who are you? You are not of the world. Jesus does not pray here. Father, I pray that you'll make them not be of the world. He says they are not of the world. That's who they are. And based upon who you are, you're conscious of what God intends. And you have been left in this world just like those disciples were left in this world. Not to be part of the world, which is a little different idea, I think, than what Jesus has in mind when He uses that expression. But it's that by implication. Not to be part of the world. Not to succeed with the world with the world's goals and the world's philosophies, but so that we make, might make known unto this world the name of the true and the living God. And I need God's help in doing what I'm about to say, but it's a fresh commitment in my soul, and that is to spend the rest of my life Seeking to make Him known. Not seeking to get people to be like me. Not seeking to get people to dress like I do or talk like I do or do the things I do the way that I do them. Because you can have all of that and not know God. but to be an instrument that God might use in this world to point people to who He really is. And I'm drawing encouragement. You see, I believe the evil and the evil one is doing all he can to distract me from that goal. And it's frustrating at times because sometimes I feel like I see the goal so clearly and then I run into people. And I run into life. It's like, I can't do this. Which I am convinced is exactly where God wants me to be. I can't do this. risen Savior, my high priest, I need you. I need you interceding. Father, I need 
what He's purchased. I need the Holy Spirit at work in me continually. And I need to be walking in the Spirit if I am going to be the effective instrument that He's called me to be. And what I'm saying about myself, you can say about you. God met with me and Jody last night and just flashed back over my life. And I don't want the rest of my years to be like what's behind me. I want to be different. And it won't happen apart from what we're seeing here in the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that that's true for you. I want you to grow with me. We're in this world for a purpose. We will not be effective testimonies of Jesus if we are living like we are of the world. We just simply won't. What does that mean? It means different things for different folks. But brethren, it ought to be at the top of our minds. It ought to be at the forefront of our hearts. I am not of this world. And so, Lord, show me what it means practically that I, I might be a more effective witness and that Community Baptist Church, I'm thinking about this church, I'm thinking about every member of this church, it grieves me. It grieves me at times when every member of this church is not here to, to join in with this moment right now together. I want Community Baptist Church as a body of believers to be manifesting Christ. Well, we need to be sanctified. We'll look at that next week, Lord willing. Father, I pray that you would press in upon us. Lord, you know the struggles I've had.